Hey guys, how we doing? Today we're going to talk about Norman Grands again and the Verve label. And we're looking right away at the JATP stuff, which comes out of the Second World War in the summer of 45. He starts doing these concerts. And they're quite innovative. He's bringing in some great talent. He demands that the audience be desegregated and that he won't book concerts in event spaces that won't allow a mixed audience to come in. He's really an ambassador for uh, change in jazz, and uh, he's also quite the business impresario. And while the early days have mixed reviews of success, by the late 40s, he's making a pretty good dollar uh, touring the nation and eventually the world with this group of musicians. And it's a who's who. It really is. And a lot of these concert uh albums 10 inches were originally 78s in the books with the covers by david stone martin and uh they eventually became 10 inches in the early 50s and eventually got recoupled on the lps in the late 50s which kind of confused some of the volume numbers at times but there's really 18 volumes if you keep the 10 inches separate from uh the the, re, uh, the recomp compiled stuff later on uh it does get a little confusing at times buying different volumes but, I mean, this is this is the way you really want to have them, I think, is right here. And uh, these albums would come out to correspond with the tours, and they sold surprisingly well. And he, the initial first one came out on uh, the Ash Stinson label, and he lost control of that release. And he fought for it in the courts for a long time. And he never really got control back of that first release. And so he was much more careful with later uh, releases. And eventually became the fella that controlled most of his own body of work, which is what allows him to reissue a lot of this stuff on Verve eventually. So Norman, with the success of the JTP and the release of the albums that corresponded, launches the Clef label, and he starts doing recording sessions outside of the live setting. He loves to do jam sessions. He loves to get people like Art Tatum in the studio and record them endlessly. Uh, Oscar Peterson and his trio were the backbone of a lot of those great sessions. The great Lester Young, Roy Eldridge, eventually Dizzy Gillespie. It was really quite an assemblage of talent that he starts recording in the late 40s on 78 RPMs. A lot of that starts to get repackaged into the 10 inches in the LP era. In the dawning of towards the end of the 78, towards near the beginning of the 10 inch, he comes up with this the jazz scene which was a deluxe, I think, 478 box with a bunch of photos in it. And a few, some people thought it was madness, and it was expensive for those days. I remember it was like 25 bucks or something at that time, which was a lot of money. But it was deluxe, and it was packaged like it was important. It wasn't presented like it was uh, something disposable. It was packaged like this was something of great importance. And the jazz scene ended up winning quite a few uh, critics minds. People like this is, was brilliant. And it eventually comes out as a double 10 inch LP in a black box that you see here. And then it gets reissued in the LP era, both on the Clef label and again on the Verve label with the, the jazz studio setting as the cover. Uh, the original photos that came with this box as a 78 version weren't available in the 10 inch LP, but you order those with a little coupon that came in the box, which I got the coupon, I don't have the photos, and I've looked online, tried to find them, I'd love to order them. I have some of the JTP photos and some of those box sets. So if anyone has a copy of those jazz scene photos, I know John Massad, you said you might have some, I'd love to get a copy of those. Uh, it's just great important history that's being documented. And so this was quite an important documentation and a new way to present the music and uh, it's a cool piece if you stumble on it. So keep your eyes open for the jazz scene. How you doing guys? Uh, welcome to the channel. And of course we're talking about Clef and Norman Grand, uh, the origins of the Verve label. And we're gonna look at some of the early Clef 10 inch work right here. And uh, starting with that great Hank Jones 10 inch is hard to find. Incredible Lester Young, Oscar Peterson stuff. Flip Phillips, a great tenor player. Uh, more Oscar Peters than at Carnegie Hall. Uh, just fantastic playing by some of the records that are the real greats. 
the great DSM covers, which I'm going to cover in a real quick upcoming episode here shortly. Uh, the Hodges Rabbit cover is fantastic. Uh, Jack Cat, who's kind of young and fiery and has been working with Lionel Hampton, the great Roy Eldridge. Uh, Charlie Burnett, who's kind of people forget was a verb artist. Ralph Burns, the great arranger. Uh, more great Oscar Peterson stuff. Uh, the Charlie Ventura, which actually has a di uh, same cover in the 12-inch, some different stuff on it. Uh, the Billy Holiday's classic, hard to find. Uh, the Count Basie, again. A couple of these might not be uh, DSM covers, actually. Uh, <clears throat> Sonny Chris, who thinks of him as a verb recording artist. Santa Bacora. Uh, Lester Young, of course, always golden stuff. The Bill Harris, fantastic bone player. Uh, Mishmash by Slim Guyard. More great Oscar Peterson. More great Johnny Hodges. It's really a pretty incredible sequence. The Illinois Jack Cat again. Collates, which is collections of 78 stuff. Anito Day, same cover for the uh, LP as the 10 inch there. And there's a few that are going to look like they are screenshots. Because they come, a couple of these are that I don't have. It's because I either have the LP with the same cover, or they're still waiting to come in the mail. Only about a dozen of all the ones I'm going to show you I don't have. There's one right there I don't have. The Slim, Slim, Slim Guy, or I don't have that Charlie Barnett. Those are just screenshots of them online. But I think with the leather couch in the background, it's a real image of something I have. Benny Carter, fantastic. I love that Carter cover, along with the Stan Getz cover. Uh, there's a Getz LP with that cover. The Holiday 10 inch has the same cover as the LP. Great Oscar Peterson singing, which I've talked about before. Lots of fantastic bassy stuff. This stuff all gets reissued in the Clef 56, uh, 55, 56 LP era, and then gets issued again in the Verve crossover. So it's, it, is, it is complicated waters. Teddy Wilson, that sucker's been in the mail from Italy for two months. The Parker stuff. Uh, the great Flip Phillips. Again, he's really a rated player. Hardy Shaw, some fast, fantastic Gramercy 5 stuff. It's really good stuff. Just a dexterous player playing in a modern vernacular. Holiday, of course. Mr. Eldridge is always at his best. Stan Wilson, a very unknown kind of artist today. More great Charlie Barnett. Uh, Roger King Mosey, another guy very forgotten today. More jazz by Jack Kett. Uh, Oscar Peterson, album number two. And then last but not least, the Billy Holiday Jazz of the Philharmonic, which is uh, actually a Japanese LP, 12-inch. I have not got the 10-inch of that yet either. But most of that stuff I have. You know I mean? I said there's a few covers in there that were screenshotted because I don't have the actual 10-inch. Either it hasn't come in the mail yet or uh, I haven't bought it yet because, like I said, the LP has the same cover. And uh, I have the music. I have the cover. The only thing, I'll, I'll buy it when I find one cheap. That I can have both, but if it has the same music and the same cover, I'm not always gonna just go out there and spend big bucks on getting just for the sake of it. Uh, it has to really be. A, I, I'm like, oh, that's a good deal for that. I'll, I'll grab it now. And so that stuff will probably be filled in at some point. But uh, so that's the Clef 100 series. Now we're gonna jump to the 500 series. And so if I'm completely honest, I'm not exactly sure why there's a 500 and a 100 Clef 10 inch sequence. The uh, 500 series is only 12, 13 titles long. A few things were scheduled to be released that weren't. Uh, there was a few titles also in the 100 series that were scheduled to be released that weren't. But uh, <clears throat> again, I, I thought maybe it's because this was stuff that was the license of Mercury, and then Clef kind of pulled it back and reached it themselves. Still don't have that Clef record sticker, which is often covering the Mercury Records logo. But uh, the 100 series has some of those as well. So I'm not exactly sure why there's a 500 series. Was it supposed to be more modern? I don't really think so. But uh, let's dive into it and we'll talk about what's here. Uh, the Parker with String stuff has been released in many forms. It's absolutely classic, legendary stuff. One of the DSM's weirder covers is that Bud Powell, Lou Waters, fantastic Dixie kind of stuff, Machito, fantastic Afro-Cuban, uh, more Slim Guyard. Again, a really interesting, great Bud Powell, great DSM cover right there. More Parker with strings, which is coupled together on the CD and the modern reissues. A cool Lou Waters, great DSM cover. More Machito Jazz with actually with Parker's on that. Uh, Dizen, Dizen Bird, fantastic stuff south of the border, Parker. A lot of Parker in this sequence. Uh, that Cubano record is really fantastic. And the Django Reinhardt's fantastic. So it's good stuff. It's, again, it was a short little run. 
then the Clef LP series starts up and repackages a lot of that, plus adds new Clef 12 inch material in that sequence at 56 to 57. C contiguous with this was the Norgrand stuff, which launched a little later than the Clef stuff, but it was again Norgrand, Norman Grands. It was his idea of putting some of the more cool artists, he thought, cooler sounding projects on Norgrand, even the more swing oriented or swing rooted guys on the Clef sequence. And in modern hindsight, you look at it, you don't really see a ton of distinction between, uh, and they have Lester Young on both imprints. You have Slim Guyar on both imprints. So it's not like this, it's some kind of, I think there's a Teddy Wilson on both. I think there's uh, on both Norgrand and on Clef. Numerous artists, Ben Webster appears on both. So it's not like there was like, but there are some people like uh, Kelly Ventura and Buddy DeFranco who feel like they're very much Norgrand guys and not so much Clef guys. It's a lot to really kind of suss out, but we're going to jump into that next. So jumping right into it, Norgrand launches, I think in 53. You have some Johnny Hodges stuff, which again, you saw on Clef. You have Dizzy and Stan, which is fairly modern. Buddy DeFranco, who shows up quite a bit here. Uh, Al Hilbler, a fantastic singer who sang with Basie. Again, there's Lester Young stuff who, uh, I mean, he's all over the Clef imprint as well. Louis Belson has quite a bit of stuff on Norgrand. Uh, Charlie Ventura, like I was saying. So there are certain cats, Chico Farrell, again, you're talking about Afro-Cuban stuff. So that's on Clef and Norgrand. Bernard Pfeiffer, the French piano player. Uh, Don Bias, who was actually in France at the time. Uh, there's some more Slim Gaillard. Uh, more Louis Belson, again, fantastic drummer, played with Basie, played with Ellington. Al Hilbler sang a lot of the great Ellington songs. There he was singing Ellington, pretty moods by Buddy DeFranco. Great DSM cover, more Gillespie and Getz. The great Tal Farlow shows up here on guitar, who you could say he was kind of cool. Uh, Charlie Ventura again, more great Benny Carter, fantastic. More Bud Powell, again, he's on clef. So George Wallington, modern, but the difference, the difference isn't super punctuated in today's kind of reference. The Buddy Rich I have on the LP with the same cover. Chico Farrell, I have that the red one, the yellow one's been coming from Italy again, two months in the mail. I don't have the Kenny, the Kenny Drew right there. I have an original pressing of that earlier one. The Onita Day is really rare. The, the Chico I've not tracked down as well. And there's uh, Afro-Cuban north of the border. Uh, some good stuff, though, on Norgrand in the 10-inch era. And as the Clef stuff from 10-inch got reissued on LP, and then eventually in the Verve 8000 sequence, the Norgrand 10-inch stuff gets reissued in the Norgrand LPs in 56 and 7, and then eventually into the Verve 8100 sequence. So 8000 is very much uh, Clef, 81 sequence is very much Norgrand. There's a few new releases sprinkled in there. The, the 1000, uh, sorry, the 4000 sequence of Ella is starting to roll out. The 2000 sequence is starting to get some new stuff, although it's, it launches with those Al Hibbler 10 inches as their first issue, or maybe that's the 4000. I mean, it's it's a convoluted realm of incredible music that he's documenting and repackaging and reissuing and recording. He's and he's doing these tours. He's relocating to Switzerland soon. So Norman Grands again is a very interesting, intricate, and important part of the jazz story. And what he's doing here in the late '50s is of the utmost importance. And if you think of yourself as a jazz fan and as something who's knowledgeable about jazz, there's really not titles from the Verve canon, the Clef canon, the Norgrand canon, especially from 52, 53, up into the late 50s. It's a really, really important documentation of the greatest players that this music has ever seen, the innovators, the drivers of the, of the sound, the great educators, the Lionel Hamptons, the Dizzy Gillespie's, they were the great teachers of this music. They led the, all the young cats that ended up at Blue Note and Prestige and Riverside, came through Lionel Hampton's band, came through Dizzy Gillespie's bands, came through Bass C and Ellington. This is important framework stuff. And without this, none of the rest of the House of Cards stands. This is the foundation. And the war is a great interruptus. Pre-war stuff, the 78 RPM stuff, it's a different day, different time. Post-war bebop comes out. The LP era starts to dawn with the 10 inches in the early 50s. It just, things are shifting rapidly in that new modern world. And jazz is a reflection of all that happening 
simultaneously. It's just a fantastic time. And as Norman built those concerts in 1945 and 1946 and 47 and 48, 49 and 50, touring America, bringing this black music to white America with integrated audiences, it's an incredible testament to a man's will and to the power of green over black and white.